All right, everyone. Well, I guess we will get started. We have a uh, little bit smaller group today than we did last time, but I thank you all for joining us for the second Conservation Conversations. And so I'm going to introduce our speaker, Michael Henn. Uh, Michael has worked at the Sublette County Conservation District since 2015. He is a Wyoming native and has been involved in agriculture and natural resources his entire life. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Wyoming in rangeland ecology and watershed management. After college, Michael worked for the Idaho Department of Lands as a senior lands resource specialist range in, you say the name, Hawaii. Thank you, <laughs> County, Idaho. <laughs> In 2006, Michael moved back to Wyoming to work for the Office of State Lands and Investments as a Senior Lands Management Specialist. In 2013, he was promoted to Field Staff Supervisor, and Michael is involved in Sublette County as a Lieutenant for the Sublette County United Fire, as well as a member of the Sublette County Fair Board. In his free time, Michael enjoys team roping, hunting, fishing, and spending time with his wife and two daughters. So with that, I'll hand it over and Michael get going. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, today we're going to talk about catastrophic wildfires that have occurred within, we're in Sublette County now, this is a presentation I gave nationally, so you can't say Sublette County, you got to say Southwest Wyoming. So digging into this, uh, many of you are, have partners on the team or have seen this talk um, with what we've done in Sublette County. I've got a little bit of data uh, to show the actual recovery outside of just uh, pictorial Example. So we're going to set the stage, you know, clear back in 2012, land owners, managers, and resource professionals had understood there was a need for resource responders, just like first responders that show up to, to fires or natural catastrophic events. So this group started formulating, um, and I've dubbed, dubbed it the resource responders. And we just needed to help people out in need. Private landowners, land management agencies that don't necessarily have the, the workforce or the expertise to devote to responding to these wildfire, wildfires that have hit our All right, so everybody knows where we sit in the state. More specifically, these are the three fires I'm going to highlight. The Fontenelle Fire, which happened in 2012 outside of Big Piney. And we'll get into each one a little more detailed. Cliff Creek in 2016 that happened started right at the entrance of the Hoback Canyon, headed to Jackson, and then more recently, it's still fresh in everybody's mind, the Roosevelt Fire that started in the upper Hoback drainage. And, uh, these are the partners that were involved with it. As you can see, a pretty diverse group of people, county, state, and federal agencies all pooled together to write grants, to, to, get, to give money, to help with, uh, help with other land management agencies work forward to make it a success. And so with that, the, the, the practices that were of big concern were grazing deferment. And so we got grants to hire riders to stay off of burned areas if the whole allotment wasn't burned. We paid for private pasture ground, for uh, private lands that were burned or some allotments, we couldn't find other areas for them to graze. We utilized vacant allotments in the National Forest System. Um, there was an allotment, if you're familiar with it, North Cottonwood had, or South Cottonwood had a grazing allotment that was vacant, so we were able to take that rancher and move him into there for the rest to allow that work. So it was very, um, we had a, a huge weed management component that is still ongoing, even though that fire burned in 2012, uh, working with the agencies to still find patches of, of uh, infestations that we need to treat. So I've got a few pictures here. Uh, this is a picture of a riparian area that burned. You can see the water, the, the drainage right here. Um, moderate severity burn right through here. And you can see two years post-fire the recovery that has happened not only in the foreground where you can see the willows starting to come up. We're starting to, you know, we're holding that soil in place. You can also see on the ridges, you know, we've got vegetation in the timber interspace, which, you know, helps hold that soil, which is key to, because trees don't grow back right away, right? So you got to get 
herbaceous vegetation back in there to allow the trees and the seedlings and the mountain shrubs to, to come back in afterwards. So they, we also, we as in the group, had some um, aspen regeneration sprouts per acre goals that were developed as a part of this, working with the land management agencies. And those were, those were also met two years post-burn that allowed the BLM and the forest to, you know, check that box that, hey, we did have recovery, livestock, wildlife, there's plenty of feed out there. Um, we're, we're on that path to restoration. And, you know, there was aspen shoots that were, you know, six, eight foot high by the end of the second year that allowed for, for good recovery there. The Cliff Creek fire uh, was a fire that started in uh, 2016. It was a lightning strike fire similar to the Fontenelle fire. The unique thing about this was it burned primarily on Forest Service property. Um, little different dynamic, right? The group wanted to, to build from their experience from 2012 and be able to improve on our response in this effort. Uh, this time we worked a little quicker. We were talking to those funding partners, the ones we knew that we were going to hit up, while the fire was burning. In fact, within the first day or two of the start, you know, we were talking to some state funding partners and others to say, hey, probably going to get an ask, you know, what's, what's the likelihood, what do you want to see different from the last, uh, last fire? So, little different group, right? We didn't have it all the land management agencies. So, focused a little more tightly just to the forest, our state game of fish partners, and a couple county partners to, to accomplish this goal. Same attack was made. Uh, we had a grazing allotment that was affected. We had um, a weed problem that we knew about within that area of the, of the fire. And so we implemented some deferred grazing we didn't have to relocate any of the livestock because it burned partial pastures. So we implemented some temporary electric fence, uh, got a grant to buy the fence and pay for a rider to maintain that fence and keep cattle. It was just a drift fence to keep cattle out of the burned area so the, the permittees could, could graze out of lava. It was very successful. This is some pictures the, of the, that the rider took. If you remember, um, 2017, we had that bad winter, right? So we, or not bad winter, we had a good winter. Let's talk about it that way. <laughs> Lots of snow, right? <laughs> Everybody that was part of this project was sweating bullets because we didn't have the vegetation under the fire scar to hopefully, you know, to keep the soil where we needed it to be as the, as the snow came off. We did have some minor slumps, minor um, landslides, nothing major, not anything as big as the landslide that occurred um, as you enter the canyon past the black powder off to the right. Nothing that major happened in the areas we thought would move a lot more. That was an unexpected one. But, um, so you can see here, uh, this is, well I guess you can't point that screen. This is the Cliff Creek Road for relation. You can see some uh, reeling and stuff in the spring very early where stuff didn't ve revegetate. But you can see plenty of, you know, revegetation starting to come back in. Again, it was a moderate severity fire. Uh, unique thing to this part of the... So right here, <clears throat> be a good example I can show you. So, you know, let's, let's talk in theory, okay? So this, this patch of trees right here, at the, the head of this draw, you know, might have been a conifer encroachment over the years due to the lack of fire on the landscape or lack of fire not killing those trees. And so anytime you have a disturbance, you're going to have, trees don't come back right away, right? You're going to have your, your annual forbs and some grasses come in and then you might get your shrubs to start sprouting and coming back in. And then your trees are kind of the last to grow, right? That whole cycle. And so, yeah, you are resetting in here. You're probably now in the, the really um, dense, like where you expect a pocket of trees to be. Are we going to get sagebrush? Probably not. Are we going to get a different brush 
uh, mountain brush like snowbush or snowberry or or uh, ribey, you know, a currant or something like that, you might get that in there. And then as those seedling conifers start growing, it'll be, you know, it, they'll outcompete the brush and they'll go through that. Same thing here, you'll get, you'll probably on the edges, right, get sagebrush to move in a certain place, um, a certain distance. And then over time, it'll get pushed back out. You know, it might take another hundred years before it gets there, but yeah, it'll, eventually it'll, it'll happen until another disturbance happens. Oh! Yeah, just like this, right? Yeah. It's a good shade tree for a cow. Now, is it probably, was it, is it encroachment? You know, there was, a, there was a definite seed bed there at one time that allowed that pine seed to, you know, or spruce seed to start. Yep. So with that, you can also go to our website, which is listed there. We have a whole page still open for wildfires. It's got a lot of technical guides. What you do with a septic tank or a well after a fire. I mean, we've got all those publications that we pointed those landowners and uh, land managers to uh, on that effort. So, I've got any questions? Daryl. Those 65 homes that were in Roosevelt, do you have an idea of how many had that mitigation in place that the state board used? So, so I, I don't have numbers. I do know that because it was also a frustrating challenge for the fire team to deal with because when they started letting people back in, people that had done those practices had lost their homes and their neighbor that didn't do a practice home was still there. So there was, there was huge, you know, which the emotion anyways tied to that is something that you know, is challenging, but um, I don't know the exact number, but I do know some homes that did firewise prevention made it, some didn't, and vice versa, some that didn't do it. You know, the thing about firewise and, and any kind of a wooey protection, it's not a guarantee that the fire won't still take your house or your property. It's a prevention method. And with the fire behavior we experienced in that move, um, I was actually on the fire lines, part of my county fire job. I was in that subdivision. That fire, we dang near didn't make her out. That's how quick that fire was moving. They had it clocked after they did um, some modeling. That fire was moving 50 miles an hour through that subdivision when it came up. They had a windy bit that, I mean, so 50 mile an hour wind and that much fuel and heat, there's not much to, you know, if it would have been a creeping fire and, you know, then firewise might have made a difference, but some of it was just moving too fast. I mean, there was pine cones flying by me on fire, so it was not necessarily the most conducive environment to, for anything to survive. The what? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, I'll ask Jennifer to correct me if I'm wrong. The log dams were never intended to be removed. The silk fence, they are supposed, this is part of the homeowners association. As a part of the, the project, 
they are supposed to go in and remove it. It should be gone by now. I have not had a chance to go back in there. I don't want to wager a bet, but um, it was on the homeowners association or the individual landowner to remove the non-native material um, the third year. Correct. Yeah. And I think a lot of them probably got removed with the FEMA grant because where we put those was probably where you should have had a culvert, you know, across the road. And so I noticed when the engineering firm was staking the second summer for that work, a lot of them tended to line up. So, but yeah, it's a good, good point. We probably should. Circle back to them. Because I didn't see that when I was one of the grantees to go put them on construction sites. They stayed there for way long. I think those were all of them were forced to be removed. Yeah, yeah, there's no teeth in the grant or the project we worked on. To, nor was there any money to go remove it. It was kind of on the landowner once the project, the practice uh, lifetime was met to pull it out. Go ahead. Well, I'm a rookie. I understood some of what you said. Yeah. But I had a question that I want to take up with the time with the elementary question. No, go ahead. What is the grazing department? Okay. I have an idea, but I don't. Yeah, so um, the federal agencies, when we talk grazing deferment, well, I'll talk grazing deferment in generality. So grazing deferment means that you are not grazing the same. Uh, piece of ground the same time every year, right? You're deferring grazing, so it's a spate, a, a, a temporal. Well, it's a well, yep, kind of a similar deal. The federal agencies have in their regulations that after a fire or an, a, a, an event, in this case fire, um, they want to see up to two years grazing deferment or rest. And so I might use the wrong word if I use deferment, but. Basically, what it means is they don't want grazing on that landscape for up to two growing seasons. And so we assisted the private landowners because we wanted them to rest their property too to, to get that, that assistance or the, the mandate from the federal land management agencies to do that. And so we worked with the landowners or the permittees, the users of the, the public lands, to find other places to go. Can you easily explain what line comes up? Yeah. So it's a it's a rangeland monitoring method to help rangeland, which is quite a few of us in the room, uh, have an understanding of what the vegetation um, composition, bare ground cover looks like. So instead of just going out there and saying, "Hey, that looks great," it actually goes out and gives you numbers, like I presented in tables, um, that'll go down to depend on how you do it, but it can go to the species level, like what specific type of grass it is versus just grass, shrub, tree kind of thing. Um, and it's literally, you just lay a tape measure out, 100, it can be whatever, in this case it was 100 feet. And every foot you drop a pin, we, you know, which is what we use is the pin flags, you know, a small diameter pin, and you call out every plant that it touches all the way down to soil. And that gives you structure as well. You can tell top hit and different structural hits through there if you analyze it that way. Or you can just go on first hit and then litter, you know, your ground cover and soil. So did I do a good job? Karen? So that's, it's just a way that managers use to assess vegetation in there. And you said some of the holdback landowners did not give you permission to? Correct. Did they give, I mean, are they, did, were they just so upset with government so, in general at that time? Why would they not let you protect their property? It's very emotional. You know, you can expect you, you come back to, 
you bought the place because it was forested and you had your little cabin and you couldn't see anybody or the road or anything and you come back to this, I'll be frank, moonscape of toothpicks and black ground and now you can see everybody and you might not have a house, you may still have a house, somewhat, you know, very. And there was big emotion, right? There was emotion tied to why didn't you stop it from happening? And then there was also emotion of now what am I going to do? I'm 80 years old. I'll never, never see this. My kids' as kids maybe will see it if it stays in the family that long. There was just a lot of emotion. Um, there was political reasons, um, internal political reasons in the homeowners association. They didn't care who was on the board, so it didn't matter if it was going to help them or not. They were going to tell the board to go down sand. I mean, there was the dynamic was there was all, across the board reasons why. Some of them just said no to begin with, and then said yes after they seen what happens when it rained even a quarter inch, um, and they came back to us. You know, it was all voluntary. That was the whole whole reason behind that grant. It's a voluntary deal. It was not pounded down your throat and you know we didn't know if they did nothing if the road would stay we were just trying to help and some of the slides you had had like pullback CMH and yeah you know, what mm -hmm. you what they okay so those are allotment names and so the forest service that's only generally in the forest service nomenclature um they used to put that on the end of every allotment name so allotment's a management unit that a, a permittee or rancher gets the grace. And so back in the day, they had allotments C, cattle and horse. And then they got S and G, sheep and goat. And then they, so it's just their, it's their management style that's lingered for, for years. Most, when you talk to them, they don't call it Hoback C and H. It's the Hoback allotment. But that's, yeah, what those. And then on the spot now, you said the aspen grows after two years or six to eight feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I... That's surprising because, I mean, I've been kind of connected by it. Yeah, I've been doing well. Okay. It's like, oh, so, I so burn my land and let it grow. So that's, uh, that's the thing with aspen. Um, you know, and I'll let anybody else chime in that was... In 12, I was detached because I was living in Cheyenne working for state lands. Um, so I wasn't out on those monitoring efforts, but Aspen in general, if you have a clone, which is an Aspen plant, they, they, op they live and grow as clones. So they, they have rhizomes that come out and shoot up, right? So it's like one plant, essentially, that can be many acres in size. And if you, it's stimulated by disturbance, not only fire, if you go down and cut them all down or doze them all over or have an a insect problem come in, they will send out new shoots. And so where you're trying to transplant, that's where Mother Nature does a better job than any anthropogenic input. So they have that root system already intact, and you just went through and burned it. And so they, they send out millions of shoots and new growth trying to replenish their their carbohydrate reserve in their their root system and where you're just grabbing a either buying or grabbing and lifting a planet out and bringing it in you know they that's where that's the reason why they they have that root system already in place and so they can get that tremendous response um, you know sometimes you can get that if you do a lift but it's rare I don't know if anybody has anything else to add to help them with that. I think that was great. I just also want to think in terms of what the climate is doing at that time. It was kind of a team of us who that was a lot of fundraisers. Yep. We didn't really have to do that in the system. In 2014, we really had to do that in the system as well. And so they created kind of a team on a big deal. You said something about polymer seedling. Yeah. Did you say you sell them? We sell polymer, yeah. So the district we got a tree program that we sell conservation grade trees and we also sell um, polymer that you can mix into the 
the soil that you're planting that seedling in that will help. And it's it's basically a yeah, it's a basically yeah chemically made sponge. <laughs>